restraining sin. By his grace, he helps us to subdue remaining. I wonder what chains are holding you back today. What chains keeping you from being all that God has designed you to be? America wraps chains around us, lying to us that we can be nominal Christians, be okay, that we can work God into our schedules and be okay. America is lying. My prayer is, through our study of the Word, going through the Bible on Sunday mornings, offering opportunities on Sunday evenings, which is still the Lord's day. Fourth commandment is not remember the Lord's hour to keep it holy. Remember the Lord's day to keep it holy. By offering you tools, I remember when I was growing up, some of you will identify with this, we, we had BTU, Baptist Training Union. Some of you don't remember that, but some of us do. BTU. And we learned in those times things about the Christian life, things about our history and heritage. Then they dropped the B part and just became Training Union, TU, on the evenings. Still went. My mother said to myself and my younger brother, we're going to training union and to church. We're not going to watch Wonderful World of Disney. We're going to training union and to church because it's the Lord's Day. And then they changed the name to church training, CT. The agenda was still the same. And then it was discipleship training. Well, why did they change the name? Because more and more professing Christians were bailing on Sunday evenings, and they were desperately trying to come up with a name and an idea to get people to come back. That is the state of the church in America. God simply says, you turn your foot to do your, Isaiah 58, we've looked at it before, to doing your thing on my holy day, I'm not pleased with that. But if you turn back to me, if you call the Sabbath of the Lord a delight, then you will ride on wings of, eagle, wings of eagles. You will, you will be blessed by me. Folks, I'm grieved at what's happened in New York. and It's going to happen in more and more places around this country. But make no mistake about it. It is a church asleep in the light in America that has allowed it. It has allowed it. Oh, yeah, the New York politicians were wicked. They're out of the pits of hell. They will, they will burn in the hottest hell if they don't repent before they die. But they're simply tools of the devil. So as Joshua was singing that song, I'm thinking, Lord, what chains are holding us? You've heard about the, the, the elephant who was at the circus who was chained when he was a baby. He was chained to a stake so he couldn't go any, any farther than the chains allowed. And he grew up and got to the there's no way that the stake or the chains would have held him if he wanted to go anywhere. But because he had been chained there as a child, they, they took the... He, he didn't go any farther than what he was chained to. I wonder how many professing Christians have had that happen to you by the enemy of your souls. He's chained you. He's, he's hooked you up to some things and has said you're going to go this far and no further. Yet God breaks the power of reigning sin. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through chapter 11, verse 1. We started this in January 6th. I told you we'd come back to it a little later in the month. Uh, I was out the 13th. Brother Norman uh, preached a wonderful message then. Last Sunday, we recognized the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. We're back to part two. Part two. Resolved. 2019. To live to the glory of God of God. This course tonight will help you in that journey, in that quest, in that pursuit. Stand with me if you would. 
you don't have your Bibles with you, we've got the text on the screen, but I think if you've been around me at all for any length of time, you know I want you to have a Bible. I wouldn't anymore invite you to a hunting trip without a, without a gun. I would invite you to church without a Bible. Follow along as I read. Verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful. Paul is quoting here this all things are lawful. He's quoting the libertine spirit of the Corinthians. Hey, we're free in Christ, man. We can do anything we want to do. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatsoever is sold in the market without raising any questions on the ground of conscience. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informs you for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, but his. Why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So therefore, so now in this conversation about uh, exercising liberty without becoming libertine or legalistic, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. Be imitators of me as I am Christ. What have we just read together? We read the inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the Lord, in a way he hasn't before, deepen and press upon us. How critical it is for the light of the gospel to go forth. How critical it is for our own well-being to discover whether or not we really are Christians or we've just bought into some anemic brand of American Christianity. How critical it is that we live for the glory of God. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, we asked you, when we looked at this a few weeks ago, what come, when I say glory of God, what do you think? What? What would be the word association game we could play with that? We also uh, looked at the children's catechism, the who made you, God made me. What else did God make? God made all things. Why did God make you in all things? For his own glory. Gets to it right there. Gets to it. And the third question, the first question of the shorter catechism is, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Then the little children's catechism says, well, then uh, why, how can you glorify God? By loving him and doing what he commands. Why should you glorify God? Because he made me and takes care of me. It's recognizing that God commands our obedience as creatures made in his image. When he saves us by grace, John says in 1 John, that his commandments are not a burden to those who have been born again. They delight in the law of God. One of the differences that you see, someone says, you mean I have to go to church? That doesn't sound like a 1 John 5 thing to me. Psalmist who been captured by God, said, I, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You see the difference? Oh, good Lord, it's Sunday. Or, it's Sunday. Thank you, Lord. See the difference? And so the glory of God, this word glory, uh, told you from the Old Testament is a, a word of heaviness and weight. You think about the glory of God, it, it talks about his weightiness, his value. In the, in the New Testament, the, the word for glory is a similar idea. Uh, it's his reputation. We reminded you that from 1 Corinthians, from Romans eleven thirty six, that for from him, what do you have? Let's do our exercise we've done for 13 years here. Inhale. Exhale. Where'd that come from? Him. From God. From Him. Through Him. Everything you think, everything you say, everything you do passes back through Him. It does get there. Is it recognized and delighted in as righteousness, as conforming to godliness, or is it offensive? 
to heaven. And then unto him. We know that the unconverted are going to stand before God in judgment and be cast into hell righteously. That there will be praise lifted to God when the unconverted are cast into hell at the final judgment. But we also know, Paul says, we must all give account for the judgment seat of Christ. We'll stand there. We thought what we said, what we didn't say, what we did, what we didn't do will be brought before us. Not to be saved by works, but to demonstrate how seriously we took the naked Savior dying on a cruel cross for us. Now, seriously, we took his teaching, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, seriously, we took what we read in Luke, Luke 14. People, people's hair curls when they read Luke 14, those verses we read. Hate? If he doesn't hate, hate? What? And, then, and then I love him. Well, now, you know, it doesn't mean hate. It well, it means something. It means if you find anything in your life claiming to be a Christ follower, Anything that gets your affection more than Jesus. Not my words. This is not some, I'm not, I'm not a fundamentalist anyway. Not some fundamentalist, wild-eyed, wild-eyed preacher. No, no. This is Jesus. You cannot be my disciple. You see, if you take these things seriously, you can understand why the disciples would go, well, Lord, who then can be saved? And Jesus answered, left to yourself, not going to be possible. God, all things are possible. We talked about those things last time. We talked about Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The sky proclaims his handiwork. Well, see, if, if he created the heavens and the earth, which he did, and they declare his glory. Then, then creatures made in his, his image are called to actively glorify God and intentionally glorify God. So our text, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Say, so, well, isn't it great that there are people who will go to the ends of the earth, those missionaries over in the hard places, turning their back on, on terra firma here in, in America. It's how they are living to the glory of God. What did you drink this morning? What did you eat this morning? What did you do this morning? What did you do last night to get ready for today? Did you do that to the glory of God? Did you eat this morning to the glory of God? Did you drink this morning to the glory of God? See, it is, folks, the argument here clearly is from the very mundane, from the practical, because I don't, I don't know anybody here unless you're on a fast, and if you are, God bless you. That's one of the spiritual disciplines we're going to study on Sunday nights. Who didn't eat or drink this morning? I don't know anybody here who won't eat and or drink later on today. And there's none of us here who will do something today. No, they won't do something. We will do. All of us will do. We'll do something or we'll choose to do nothing. And doing nothing is a choice to do something. You see, whatever to the glory of God. So, the way Paul phrases this, it's an obligation. But it's interesting. Again, you go back... It's an obligation placed upon us because God loves us enough to put us in a position to make us conform to the image of his son. So you delight. Children do not naturally, let's mean, little bitty children love brushing their teeth because it's another way, particularly when they, when they finally have a tooth show up, it's another way to be messy. They love it. They love it. They get a little older. It's tedious. I have to brush my teeth. 
Only the ones you want to keep. Only the ones you want to keep. See? And when they grow up and they have a beautiful smile, they're grateful. Someone loved them enough, get them to brush your teeth. God's smarter than we are. But he places upon us an obligation to glorify him. 1 Corinthians 6, 20 says, you're bought with a price. If you're saved here today, and I know there are people sitting here who are not saved, and, and we pray that God will come upon you with the gospel of the crucified and risen Savior, and that you will say, oh, I need a Savior, and that you'll be saved. And then when, you, when you're saved, you'll be drawn into the fellowship of the gospel and protected from people who would teach you that it's not a big deal. If you're saved here, you glorify God with your body. See, we th- I mean, and we th- obviously the big thing we think, well, we don't avoid sexual immorality, avoid, avoid a lifestyle of wantonness and, and pagan conduct. Yeah. It's your body. You never get away from it as long as you're alive. Where your body is. Where your body's going. Where it's not going. See, your body. You're saved here. He, he purchased you. I'm not my own anymore. I was bought with a price. We're supposed to praise him with our, uh, glorify him with our praise. Look at Psalm 50, 23. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. The one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of the Lord. Offers thanksgiving a sacrifice. Now, we don't bring animals and slaughter them, but hey, you know, you got to sacrifice some things to get in the flow of God's. You got to sacrifice your own comfort. You got to sacrifice laziness. You got you to sacrifice uh, things you'd rather do. You got to sacrifice when your will finds itself at cross purposes with God's will. And America, by and large, knows nothing of this. That's why I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Preachers who have not been faithful in the pulpit, churches who have not been faithful in, in life, persecution is coming to this country. See, God, God says, look, you can do this here. We're going to see tonight that one of the ways God influences his people is through other people. Circumstances. You can do this from clear revealed scripture. Or I'll send the people to you that'll punish you, that'll strip away every freedom that you use to be licentious. I'll put you on your knees. Oh, but God wouldn't do that. Well, ask our friends in China about that. Ask our friends in Korea about that. Ask our friends in any Middle Eastern country about that. See, folks, it may not be too late but when you can see a state in this country authorize the killing of a baby on that baby's birthday, then God has taken his hand away. That's not a safe place. It remains for us to hide ourselves in the cleft of the rock where the glory of God shadows. So we've looked at these things. I want us to kind of I want to move forward today. We glorify God in two ways by making, but not God. We glorify things in two ways by making that thing or person glorious. We can't do that to God, but God does that to us. Psalm eight four and five. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. The psalmist recognizes that compared to God, we're nothing. We're nothing compared to him. We're nothing without him. Yet you've made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. What's the, what's the glory and honor we're crowned with? Being made in the image of God. Give, give, given rational capacity to communicate with God. Reason to understand the will of God. You may have a pet cat or a pet dog or a pet rabbit at home. That being will never understand the will of God. You can. So we can't, we don't enhance God, but we can make his praise glorious. Look at Psalm 66, 
Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. We haven't enhanced who God is, but we have acknowledged who he is in praise. We can always be improving our worship to, to praise the glorious God. A second way to give and glorify is, is how he's called us to. That's by acknowledging and declaring and valuing the glory that is there. It's magnifying glory that is already possessed. That's why we said earlier, Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens don't make God glorious. The heavens declare glorious God. We magnify the Lord. Psalm 34, 3. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. People will be able to look at us. It grieves me when I'm driving through my neighborhood on Sunday mornings. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Nine out of ten homes. There's not a creature stirring, not even a mouse. See, they know it's the Lord's day. They simply have made themselves the Lord. Their day. Magnify. Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with song. I will magnify him. You just take what is already there and you focus on it. You know, you take a magnifying glass and you take something that's really small and make it large. Take a telescope, though. Take something that appears to be small Telescope, you see how massive it is. That's, that's how we magnify the Lord. We show how massive He is. We, in, in Christmas season, we looked at Mary's at the Magnif Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. So when it, when it comes down to it, of everything God has made, those creatures made in His image, which is you and me, are the most responsible to make His glory known. And within that group, those image bearers who have been saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we are the most responsible of the most responsible group. We have the greatest opportunity and obligation to bring Him glory. When we think about that, we recognize that sin is a rejection of God's glory. What we're seeing played out in our nation right now is Romans 1.21. Although they knew God, the folks in New York that made these decisions know God. He's put eternity in their heart. They know there's a God. Although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. You see, people choose to sin, however that manifests itself, whether it's allowing the slaughter of, of babies born and unborn, just deciding that it's my time. I'll, I'll do my time my way, and God will just have to deal with how I do it. We choose to sin because we believe lies rather than the truth. People don't believe that. Psalm 16, 11, you've made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there's fullness of joy. People don't believe that there's more joy to be found in the presence of God than there is anywhere else. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. They don't believe that. They really don't believe that God dispenses the greatest pleasure to be found in life. They think they've found pleasure somewhere else. A lie. They don't believe Psalm 19, 7 to 11, the law, the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they, the law of the Lord, the word of the Lord, than gold, even much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and dippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, and keeping them there's great reward. People don't believe that. Professing Christians don't believe that. When you're born again, John says, the commandments of God are not a burden. They're a delight. You see, if we believed those things, we wouldn't choose sin. We believe the lie that God grades on the curve. 
We believe the lie that God will accept any old thing you'll give him, a little tip of the hat here, a little toss of the coin there. We believe that lie, and it's, it's a devil's lie. You shall not surely die right out of the garden. He hadn't changed his MO. In fact, he goes, God, God knows when, you've, when you do what you think is best, you kind of become your own God. You, you get to choose what's right and what's wrong. God will just tag along because he's that desperate for people to pay attention to him. That's the devil's lie. Oh, all nations of the earth, no nation has seen more light. No nation has been exposed to more gospel light and privilege. Twice in our country we have seen a downpour of the Spirit of God in the first and second great awakening. They were about 100 years apart. Do you want to know how displeased God is with this country? Last awakening was in the early to mid-1800s. 1900s, 100 years pass, the downpour of God. 2000, another 100 years pass, the downpour of God. 19 years into this century, no downpour of God. Yet in the 1700s and 1800s, they saw two within a hundred. Electing Donald Trump as our president didn't in and of itself please God. Delighting in God's glory would, however. We need to actively engage ourselves in glorifying God, showing his worth and his value by the way that we worship, witness, live in every aspect of our being. Our children know, make no mistake about it, our children know whether living for God, glorifying God is important to you or not. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, the scripture says, and the children's teeth are set on edge. They're going to be the ones that have the bitter taste from the parents living as if you can ignore God and still be a follower of Christ. We bought the lie. Hook, line. Someone, I think it was my brother in a message, he talks about how a newly, a newly engaged young woman doesn't casually consider her soon-to-be husband. Were you going to see him? Ah, I don't know when else. I'm sure I'll see him sometime or another, you know. You going to spend time with him? Well, you know, I'm pretty busy, but it's going to be good to be married. No, you, you said, that's foolish, preacher. I'm not a bride-to-be who was excited about the prospects of marrying the, the man of her dreams. Act casually. No, when she talks about him, she lights up. Really? You're going to sleep as soon as I can. And we're supposed to get together. Right? Yet yeah, we think we can date God casually. Leave all the benefits of the blood of the cross. It doesn't work that way. John said in the prologue to his gospel that we beheld his glory. We didn't have it flashed in front of our eyes for a few seconds. And well, that's, 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 man, that's fascinating. Wow. Wow. Dude. We beheld. Captured us. It captivated us. It transformed. Paul said it this way. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. <laughs> the God who created, who spoke. Ex nihilo. And nothing became something. God who said, let there be light, and there was, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's your experience? That's the only experience for someone who's been saved by grace through faith. Paul said it this way about, about the value of that, Philippians 3, 7, nine, whatever, I, whatever gain I had, whatever I thought was valuable, I counted as loss. For the sake of Christ. Nothing was more important to me than knowing Christ, living for Christ, following Christ, worshiping Christ, serving Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss. 
because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. And he talks about how he suffered. Lord, we haven't suffered. I think we will. But we haven't. And I count them as rubbish. And you know good and well that that's cleaned up in the English. Whatever was valuable to me, I count it as a pile of manure. In order that I might gain Christ. Be found in him. In other words, Paul recognized that even after being saved, there was still the temptation to value what was equivalent to manure over glorifying Christ, following Christ, living for Christ, serving Christ, worshiping Christ, sharing Christ. But that, that danger was there. Jim Elliott, who we just, I think we just had the 50th anniversary, I believe, of, of the slaughter of those missionaries by the Aka Indians. Jim Elliot said this, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot. Isn't it interesting? We're clinging to things that we cannot keep. Clinging, I mean just, he is no fool who gives that up that he can't keep in order to gain what he cannot lose relationship with Christ. One more story and I've got to shut it down, okay? Eric Little, one of my favorite figures, one of my favorite movies, Chariots of Fire. If you hadn't seen it, hadn't seen it in a while, go watch it again. Eric Little in the 1924 Olympics, Paris, was given the opportunity to run his favorite race, a race he was guaranteed the gold medal in. And they said it's scheduled on Sunday. He said, I want to run it. But it's good. I want to run it. It's the Lord's day. In the movie, you say, well, it's, in my day, it was, it was king and country first and God second. And he basically says, I'm sorry for you. What's he going to do? He's there. Well, one of his friends switches races with him who didn't have the Lord's day convictions that Eric Little as a follower of Christ did. He ran a race he had not trained for. It wasn't on Sunday and won a gold medal. That's the kind of conviction we need today. I'll not do it. I'll not compromise. Clearly revealed word of God. Prospects by being found great. Now, folks. To pass up the opportunity for a gold in the Olympics and an Olympic record, what are you facing? What are you facing? Oh, people. And if, if, I'm, if I'm the cause of your lethargy and I repent, make it known so I can get out of the way. You and I are living in a time storm clouds have formed. And they're coming against this country. We're going to look foolish as followers of Christ blaming New York for our problem. We're going to look foolish as followers of Christ blaming the Congress for our problem. Blaming people coming to our country bringing drugs and violence. Why? Because we, followers of Christ, have the Spirit dwelling in us, and the wherewithal, if we will be people of God, if we will take God seriously at His Word and realize, I was saved to be conformed to the image of Jesus. I will do everything in my life humanly necessary to move in that direction. Someone brilliantly has given us materials to run on and learn in response to a command from Scripture. We would be that people. God might well use a spark of flame here. People years from now would look back on it and call third great awakening. 
But if we yawn at that, we have no reason to expect anything. Storm clouds move. Sweep over this nation, and it will be a wasteland for your children and your grandchildren to grow up in. And every freedom you and I have enjoyed and squandered will not be offered. Hang in the balance. Glory of God. For the glory of God. Plead with you. Eating, drinking, doing, scheduling. Let God be my helper. 2019, today, tonight, going forward. My life will count. Perhaps as it never has before, or perhaps for some, like it did once, before I began to buy into the yawn of American Christianity. Count the of God. God help us. Find us faithful. Your Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, our nation is sick head to toe. It is depraved in ways that our Founding fathers could never have imagined. We know angels in heaven must look with shock on how the blood runs in the streets of this country. Perhaps even more shock how the church sleeps through most of it. God. Awaken us here. Raise us up as disciples who take your word seriously. Say with our lips and with our feet, with our schedule, our hands, hearts. God, I want this year to be marked by living for the glory of God. And Lord, through that I pray, blessing upon blessing will come in our lives, our homes, our children. Forgive us for us having taught them to yawn at Forgive us for distorting who you are by saying to them in word and deed, God understands. Okay. Offer ourselves to you. Empty us of whatever's in there that is hindering us from living to your glory, sold out, all in. Fill us with your spirit who will, who will provoke in us love and good works, devotion to Christ, desire to be more like him. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing as we prepare to be dismissed.